on. <laughs> cool. Then it's go. Our voice is online now, so. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening for this wonderful event and thank you also to our guests internationally who are signed in via the video link. Because we are doing this as a video link conference, we aren't going to have a break in between our speakers, we're just going to run perfectly through. So if during the presentations you'd like to get up and take advantage of some of the amenities, there are beverages, tea, coffee and snack, please feel free to do so. For anybody who'd like to know where the restrooms are, it's just that dark door over there. We've got two amazing speakers for you this evening, both of whom have produced significant bodies of work in the area of cybersecurity, but both with a common focus on the human aspect of how humans interact with technology. And I suppose you could also say how technology interacts with humans. I'm not going to introduce what they're saying because they're gonna give themselves a little bit of an intro when they come out. Before we do begin with the speeches, I just wanted to give a quick thank you to Startup Wise Guys. They're hosting us this evening. For those of you internationally who might not know, Startup Wise Guys are one of the largest startup incubators in Estonia and one of the biggest players in the game. They've been in operation for over seven years now and they've run over 147 startup companies with a combined market raise of approximately 49 million euros. So thank you, thank you for them to provide all of the facilities that we've had today. Um, we're going to begin with Ralph Ekamendia, who's done a huge body of work in the field of cyber security, intellectual, intellectual property, data protection, and he's gonna give us a brief talk for 20 minutes. We'll then have a 10 minute Q&A session, followed by Claire Lane, who's currently based out of NATO, but has kindly given us 20 minutes of her time this evening. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Ralph. Thank you. Thank you. Click on that. Microphone switch. Testing one, two. Uh, thank you. It's always, uh, always a pleasure to be here um, and with you guys. Some, some of you I know, some of you I don't. But uh, we'll get to know each other better. And so that is actually where we start all this, is the human aspect of cybersecurity. And um, in 27 years, I've been doing a lot of different things in cybersecurity. I have done, uh, started off originally with penetration testing, specifically the offensive side of cybersecurity. And in fact, most of my, I can tell you some stories, which I will, about the human aspect, because um, more than the technical aspects, some of the most damaging hacks happen with the humans, not really the technology. So I'll give you one of those examples. Uh, the other aspect of it is the fact that the human element in cybersecurity is also uh, one of the ones that has the biggest problems. There's such a lack of cybersecurity people when you look at the numbers. It used to be that if you had, you know, 3,000 computers in a company, then you needed, you know, there was some kind of a calculation to how many system and network administrators needed to maintain 3,000 systems. Now we're talking about 3 million systems and usually are literally a handful of cybersecurity experts that are dealing with all of that. Uh, because now we have mobile, we have desktops, we have servers, we have all these different things to deal with. So there's not even a calculation to say anymore, well, how many cybersecurity people are there compared to the number of systems that, that will be impacted by that person's uh, direct responsibilities. So there's that aspect of it. And then there's the other aspect of this human issue, which is the way that we interact with technology, how inter technology interacts with us, and the fact that for the most part, um, we do things on a computer we would never do in real life. You know, your parents told you don't talk to strangers, we talk to strangers. Um, every single thing you can possibly imagine that normally we don't, wouldn't do, even going back to the hacking side of things is, you know, even in the 
early days, I guess now I'm technically considered a grandfather in this, in this arena because in the last 20 years, it's, that's, hacking has really changed. And you know, if I compare myself to some of the people that I work with, um, by technology standards, they're way, way past my understanding of certain things. Um, technically, the way I used to do it. But uh, even back then, certain things we would never do is you don't run down the street, shoot somebody, and then go, I shot him. I did it. But on the internet, going back to those days, we would use a handle, a, a, a pseudonym, to go and tell people, yeah, we did that hack. This is before they had laws preventing us from doing this, but you know, it was, that's something that you would never do. So technology and the way we interact with technology immediately does do something different in the way that we act, that we would not normally act. Um, and really, it's very simple. I hope somebody keeps track of my time here. Um, it's really very simple to fool the human in general, to fool a human to, well, especially when you're making very small requests. Um, you know, one example of those is, I'm sure you've seen the Cambridge, I think, the University of Cambridge had this whole study that you can put an entire paragraph and make every word, you know, mumbled up, but as long as the first letter and the last letter of every word was right, you can read it, even though it's not, it's not readable. So we don't look at the detail. We tend to look at the, 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 the whole thing. Now, when you think about what we can do on a computer now, I mean, we can make a website look like we're eBay in a matter of an hour. We can do all kinds of things uh, to make people believe something that, that isn't um, and basically lead them in a certain direction and very quickly build trust, which is one of the most confusing things in my time of cybersecurity and even in my current problem, well, why should we trust you? Well, why do you trust that page? Yet you do. That's crazy to me. Most people are still, you know, tend to trust the things that have no real oomph behind them. Right? How do you know that what you're looking at is actually what you're, what you're supposed to be seeing? Because there are so many different ways to make that change. Right? Even legitimate websites like the big known names that we have, there is JavaScript exploits that you can run to change something. Yes, you're on Amazon, but that's not the price. Right? So there's a lot of different things that ultimately what we perceive, what we see, and this is so easy to change for humans. So let's tell you one of those stories. And I know this is going to be a little bit weird, but uh, so one of those stories was the, uh, this is many years ago where I had to do a penetration test for a company, and there's a team of us working on this. This company was based in Mexico. It was a very large multinational conglomerate. Their facilities in Mexico, which were not in Mexico City, but another city, um, was like, you know, Google campus. 11, 12 buildings, a wall all around it, two entry points, one with armed guards, the other one for employees, soccer stadium, I mean, you name it. All of this stuff was inside behind these walls, their own bank, their own hospital, their own everything. That's how big this company is. They have their own banks, they have their own logistics, they have their own beer, they have their, I gave away a little bit of who they are, but they basically are huge. And at the time, they had no real internet presence. There was no easy way to kind of figure out. Even email was hard to determine how their email, even if they had email, there was, it's not like they gave it out on business cards even. So uh, again, from the outside, from the perimeter, there was not much I could see. And there was not a lot that we can do. And our job was to break in. So we, uh, part of the scope of this was doing social engineering, which is the hacking the human part. And uh, so what we came up with here um, is actually, it's kind of funny, it's called the Japanese camera trick. And the reason it's called that is because the Japanese um, were the first to do this on a TV show many, 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 so many years ago that this was before that. Uh, and the trick was that you had a bunch of uh, a crew pretend to be a crew, but they're not really a crew. And they pretend to be journalists or something, filming something. And that's how they got into to a place that you normally can't get into. For some reason, back to very much like how we 
Uh, psychologically, something happens different when we deal with technology on a screen. Same thing happens when a camera gets turned on. For some reason, you become somebody else. Uh, you react differently. And so this is one of those psychological weaknesses. So we decided to pretend to be, you guessed it, a bunch of students who are working on a project from the nearby university. And why would you do that? Well, because you would imagine that there has to be some people here who may have gone to uh, Talent Tech, or you pick, pick the region we're in, and it's going to be somebody who works there must have gone there. So that's part of the, the psychology of what we're going to use here. Uh, second was there, was there was three guys here. Um, that doesn't work. It's great to see at a cybersecurity talk more women than guys, because you guys have actually the upper hand not only in the way you think, but in the fact that you're women. And this is one of those places where if I had it, I would use it, because we had to use it. We knew that most of the security guards that we were going to be dealt with were going to be guys. And it's a known fact, a psychological fact, especially in social engineering, that women will get more information out of women than guys will. Okay, And even guys to women will not get that kind of information. So. Be a woman when you can, which is really hard for me to do. So, um, so we had to go and basically find a woman. And my thought was, well, we're, gonna, we're pretending here. So who, who's the best pretending people we can go find? Well, the university actually does have a theater department. Might as well go find an actress. And we went to the university and said, hey, where's the theater department? And said, over there. And then we went over there. And sure enough, they were, they were doing a little theater play. And just sat there and looked at the play and said, OK, she'd be good for this. So when she came off, we talked to her and said, look, we're doing this thing, which of course she found completely bizarre. <laughs> um, said, are you, well, you say, are you joking with, you know, no, 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 this is really our job. And our job is to break into this company, which of course everybody there knows. And so I showed her, I had to so sit her down and show her the paperwork and be like, you see, we can't really get in trouble for this. I and mean, we can get arrested, but we can't get in trouble. So, um, so she was hesitant at first for a little while, but then she found it to be interesting. And so we rented a, a van. We rented a whole bunch of equipment, the fuzzy microphone, the camera, all that kind of stuff. And then we equipped this equipment to actually be spying devices, even though they are kind of spying devices. But uh, we equipped one of these fuzzy microphones to have a camera in it. And, I'll, and you'll see why this makes sense in a minute. Um, and then we had actually a guy in the car. And then I'm the producer. And this is all in Spanish, so we had to script this to a degree. And then another one of the, the guys on our team, who in this case was the cameraman. And uh, I'm the producer, and she's the interviewer. So we came up to this gate with armed guards and said, we are here to do a documentary on the emergence of this technology. And we're university students. And the guard said, if you don't have an appointment and they don't, they're not expecting you, can't help you. That's policy. Um, and so just on cue, the actress was like, you guys, I told you we should have done this before. We have a deadline of Friday, blah, blah, blah. All of this in Spanish and created this whole drama. OK, was almost crying. Okay, and then after about a minute and a half of, ah, she turns to the security guard and goes, is there really no way you can help me? <laughs> and of course the security guard goes, well, let me see what I can do. And so he picks up the phone and he calls somebody and sure enough, the person he calls is the director of communications, which is basically public relations for the company. And of course that person also happened to be a female, but also happened to be a graduate from the university. So of course she was like, of course we're going to help our fellow graduates. So she said, you'll be down in 15 minutes. So now here we are at this security gate okay, of this place. So Mr. Producer here goes, hey, since we're here, we might as well start filming here. You mind if we interview you? I mean, it's OK. You're Communications director is coming, so we just do a little interview. Cool. Okay, so she comes up. Oh, this is going to be great. As soon as she comes up and starts talking to him, boy, he changes. 
He went from being a real bad word to a smile because the camera's on, okay? And so now, you know, he's talking and I'm like, you know what? It would look better if we were in the room with all those TVs that you have behind you. Look really good for a camera, you know? Just do it in the room, so. We now move into the room where there's another security guard and this is all their cameras, you know, all their CCTVs back on the wall. And so we walk in there and put the, one of the fuzzy mics in a corner where I can actually be, you know, I've got the little, I look professional, you know, I've got the, the whole listening device, which is actually talking to the guy in the van. And the guy in the van, um, he's telling me, yo, move the camera to the left, move the camera to the right, which is actually a camera that's inside the fuzzy mic. So that he can see where all those CCTV cameras may be. And so, well, we talked and great, all this is perfect. Okay, action. She asked some questions, he answered some questions. A little to the left, a little to the right, okay. Great, awesome. And then the lady showed up. Okay, and she took us on a full tour of this facility. I mean all 11 buildings. What they did at every building, their data center. And as we went through there, what do you think was going on? The camera was rolling and people are logging in on camera. So we, passwords. Now we got passwords. Not only that, but I left the fuzzy microphone by mistake. It was not a mistake. Um, so that as we were walking through the buildings, the guy in the van could see where we were. Where, where, where there was camera coverage and where there wasn't camera coverage. And so now that we've mapped the whole place, we are now walking out of there. We go through all this footage and we have passwords. We have manual codes. This is before your cards. Uh, we have all kinds of stuff. It's great. We have system administrator passwords. We have human resource people's passwords. We have finance people's passwords. We have all these different things. And so at the end of this, um, I basically, when it was time to, you know, at, at the end of the day for penetration testing, your deliverable is a piece of paper. It's a report. We don't fix anything. We, we break things and then we tell you how we broke them. <laughs> That's it. So on that report there are some recommendations, but we're not responsible for the implementation of the recommendations either. And rarely should you actually be on both sides of that fence because it's a bit of a conflict of interest if you're the guy breaking it and you're the guy fixing it. You might be purposely creating the breaks to keep your job. So you should never hire the same people to do the same job twice. Um, especially never hire the same people, which by the way, is not what companies do. Most corporations hire the same companies to do all their security. And that's not a good idea. So, yes sir, five. I thought you were giving me a high five. That was a high five. Um, so at the end of this, we have to present our findings and I say to the board of directors of this company, I want you to have one technical person, you pick the technical person, and the business people. No more than one technical person in the room for this because it's, just usually, it's all bad news. And if you put more than one technical person in the room who can translate whatever we're talking about technically, it tends to become a very ugly situation. Same thing goes the other way around. If you're having a technical meeting, have one person from management, don't have two or five, because it becomes uh, an ugly situation. It's uh, start throwing stuff at each other. This is your fault, this is your fault. So the best way is to do it that way. And so here we have the chairman of the board of this multinational company, a bunch of his EIEIOs, as I call them, CEO, CFO, CEO. <laughs> and the EIOs are sitting there, and they're one technical person. And we go, and now I asked to meet at a specific building in a specific conference room, which they found weird. And it was weird, but then you'll see why. Um, it was in why this specific conference room, why in this specific building, is because that's where the printer with the checks was. And so, we went through and we did our findings and said all the things that, that, that we had to say, that we found, and our recommendations, what they should do. And uh, you know, we timed this, we said we want the meeting to be on a Friday at 11 o'clock, from 11 o'clock to 1.30. We needed two and a half hours in this conference room, in this building. 
So that, that to them was already weird because they didn't know that we knew the buildings or conference room numbers. Remember, we're not supposed to have gotten in. And uh, so once we got in there, once we actually sat there and started our presentation of findings around 11.45, 11.50, one of our guys walked out of the room, went over to a computer, logged in his accounting, printed the, pr printed the check, and came back in the room. Sat back down, we finished the presentation of our findings, and then I just passed the chairman of the board a check that said, okay, our work is done, all you have to do is sign the check. Now up until that point, I can tell you that here's why the human element is so important. Up until that point, he didn't feel hacked. We just showed you all these passwords. We just showed you all this stuff, and he's just still sitting there like. But as soon as he saw a check come in front of him and tell him, now just sign the check, now he felt violated, and he said, how did you get this check? I said, we just told you, we had accounting passwords, we had all this information, so we can print out our own check. Well, you're, you're not even in the payment system as a provider. I said, well, we are now, so just sign the check and we're done here. He signed the check and called security to escort us out. <laughs> so, so the point of it is the human element is, is ultimately the worst one, and the thing is, is you know, most of the, the, the hackers are not good communicators, so they, they can't do a lot of the human element. Uh, they can do this really well, but they can't do this really well. Uh, those who can do this really well uh, and do that really well are even more valuable, but the point is all of that together, there are not enough people in the world with the knowledge required to actually look at all of these different areas of cybersecurity. And ultimately, we are the weakest link, we continue to be the weakest link, and we are also the solution. The solution is not going to be in software or technology. It's not an innovation. It's us being part of that process and realizing that only us have to actually be involved. We can automate many things, but without the human element and without the humans behind it, even with brands, something I'm going through myself, people don't connect with brands. They connect with people. Unless your name is Coca-Cola, Harley-Davidson, or some big name, but even if I said Microsoft, you're going to say Bill Gates. And if I say Apple, you're going to say Steve Jobs. People are key to this process in technology, and even more so with cybersecurity. You've got to feel it, and then you'll understand what it means. Otherwise, it's just another thing happening, but it's not happening to you. So anyway, thank you. That's it. I'm done. What are we doing now? Any questions? So we have five, ten minutes for it. I have a question. Shoot. We used uh, very strong communication to scare shit out of them, to, to make the feel. Uh, have you tried a different kind of feeling that it, it won't be so strong? Doesn't, it won't it work? Or it's a great question and one that I, uh, I, I, I'm going to say that I agree with where you're going with that, which is, look, it, the, the entire cybersecurity industry, both the legal and illegal, and it's questionable which one is which, um, is all based on fear, uncertainty, and doubt. From a sales perspective, from a how it's sold, it's all fear. It's all uncertainty. How do you know you're not hacked? It's all doubt. It's all creating this fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I agree with you. That doesn't really help. Um, because uh, it's not a matter of you know, selling this to a CEO. It's a matter of the janitor feeling the same way. Everyone in the company or everyone in the world is, is, is something somewhere. But at, the, at first, they're a consumer. And the way it's being sold to consumers is all fear. This just happened. It's always bad news. There's never good news associated with cybersecurity. You're never going to hear, oh, and this company just passed with flying colors. Not going to happen. So I agree with you that we have to find a different way to do it. And, I, uh, and in fact, I'm myself exploring and uh, experimenting with that with my own venture and using something very different, but that we all, we all still love. Everybody wants to be cool. Everybody wants to feel cool. 
You buy those Nikes because that guy wore them and he's cool. So cool is a feeling. And, and actually in sales and marketing, and this is a very psychological thing, okay? Um, one of the things that I've discovered is that it doesn't matter, to a large degree, the product doesn't matter. I don't care if you sell socks, motorcycles, soda, or technology products. The same thing applies in any of these products, any product pretty much, is how does the product make you feel? So I'll, I'll use a, a motorcycle as an example, and I'll use socks as an example, two very completely different products. If I say to you, Harley Davidson, you know what that is. That's one of those brands that you don't know who made it. I'm sure Harley and Davidson were involved, but <laughs> it's, it's become a brand. And when you look at a Harley Davidson, you go, that's a good looking bike. That's a feeling. The feeling of wow. That's a feeling, wow. Wow, that's a cool looking bike. And then if you walk over to the motorcycle and you sit on the motorcycle and you turn it on, then you go, whoa, that's a feeling. Then if you actually drive it around, by that time you're gonna reach the feeling of, hmm, should I spend 27,000 euro on a motorcycle? That is the feelings associated with cool things. Wow, whoa, hmm. You can, do, you can see that with Apple. Well, at the time, everybody was selling these boxy things called computers, and Apple came and made this weird looking thing that's also a computer. It made you go, wow, that doesn't look like a computer. What is that? First feeling of wow. And then you actually went and touched it, and you were like, whoa, this is different. And then, hmm, should I buy this thing for probably two times the price of a PC? Same thing with socks, by the way. Socks are a hot thing right now. As you're into it, get into socks right now. Um, same thing, take off your shoes, wow. Is that the Beatles on your socks? Wow. You know, whoa, where'd you get that? Where can I get that to? Hmm, should I spend 15 euros on one pair of socks? That's it. So the feeling of wow, whoa, hmm, is something that we don't have in cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is being dealt with like, oh shit, that's the feeling. It starts with, oh shit, what just happened? Is it happening to me? Is it going to happen to me? So it's not the same feeling. We have to try to address this more from a wow, well, hmm. And my approach has been that when you actually, when you allow people to feel being the hacker, it creates a wow, as opposed to being the hacked. So the first thing is sit somebody down and go, here's this, here's the phone, here's the thing. I'm gonna tell you what to do. Boom, you're in the phone. Look, watch, you can see what the person's doing. They go, wow, that's cool. What they don't realize that just happened is now they know how not to be hacked because they would recognize certain signs of being hacked. So we have to definitely shift the way that we communicate, market, and sell cybersecurity to be something that is actually more fun than it is something scary. I did a, I'm not a type of security uh, I did a, a course at university. And it was technology explaining these things. Okay. Right. I, I'm not hacking still, luckily, because I'd be I'd be the disaster that really, you know, has all the bells and whistles on that it's coming. Yeah. But uh, it was it, it does work. It, it, because I think that one of the problems is that it's it's perceived as too difficult. You know, yes. something that's beyond me, it's not beyond you. Oh, it's you, not beyond. It's so, exactly. I mean, anything that you don't know is difficult. Uh, but the moment you know it, it's not difficult anymore. It's like, oh, how do they do that stunt? Uh, oh, they actually do, uh, how do you do magic? And then somebody shows you, you go, oh, that's not that hard. You know, it's only hard and difficult because you don't know. And the perception is that it's some kind of magic. Yeah, and somehow everyone uses smartphones, everyone uses computers. And then they, then they think that the security is someone else's problem. No, you're using these things. Why do you think it's not your problem? And that's, that's the most important thing to be said here. It's your problem. There's this misconception that it's the company's problem. Well, or it's the government's know. problem. No, no, there is no government and there is no company. It's called people. And they happen to work at the company and at the government. Those things are just some construct we made for, the, for how we operate. But we're all consumers first. We're all using technology first. Doesn't matter where you work. That's secondly. First is that we're all just consumers. We're all just using all this technology everywhere. And yet we think, oh no, it's their problem to fix it. 
It's their problem to make us safe. No, it's their problem to make you safe in a building. And therein lies the big, the big human psychological disconnect, is we do not see cyber as a environment. We don't. We still have not understood that it's an environment. Like, it's summer, it's fall, whatever. You know, it's, it's an environment that we live in. And we don't think of this cloud internet thing as an environment. But in fact, at least in the US, now there's the air, land. I mean, as far as military, cyber is considered a domain, an environment that needs its own military people that have nothing to do with the jets, nothing to do with the fire, nothing, nothing with the Navy. So we just have not really considered that. Your point about also have cyber uh, security um, parties now. With what? You and Bo and Interpol yeah. both have cyber, cyber parties. Uh, yes, yes. So I mean, they do understand that there is an environment. What I'm saying is they, they can't address us if we say yes. Yeah, you can do whatever you want, but we're the ones. If you fire us and use Facebook, it's not Facebook's problem, it's your problem. Exactly. So we are all hackers and we're all anti-hackers. And when we understand that and that the world we live in is more virtual than it is physical now, um, then I think let's make it fun and not scary. All right, microphone hand back. Microphone hand back. Thank you for that wonderful speech. It, it's really inspiring to work around people who have all of these technical skills and these abilities. And I've been doing it for several months now and gradually I'm getting the appreciation of the concept that I shouldn't have all my passwords on my Google Notes account. <laughs> this is a serious concern. I, I, I get this nagging feeling, it keeps on coming to me again and again and again and again in all of these conversations about something called blockchain, which I thought was a hors d'oeuvre for the first three hours that somebody was talking to me about it. I probably shouldn't have all of these passwords in one place. But they're really long, I can't put them anywhere else. Luckily we have another speaker for you who's slightly more inspired than I am. Claire comes to us with an amazing international background, currently based in the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defence Centre for Excellence. She has advised politicians, government ministers, she's worked globally across several countries, and more than that, she's an enormously entertaining speaker, so I wanted to make her just a little bit pink and red in the face so that she'd be nicely colour coordinated for us. It's not the weather, it's you. Yeah, right. Oh. <laughs> A seamless, seamless handover. Right, on, on the, I just, excuse me, I know I'm just off camera for a second. I, I have to say that um, being in this venue, um, Startup Wise Guys um, hosted an event last week which I was privileged enough to attend and uh, I love some of the strap lines that they come up with for their businesses. So on the back of that amazing introduction which I now feel really pressured by, I just want to hold up this for the camera because I think, I think this actually, um, you failed Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure you under-promised the following. Yeah, I think, I think it was, it was going with that one. Yeah, 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 one. yeah. So anyway, so yes. Um, so I find it quite interesting. Um, thank you, Ralph. You've done a seamless hand over there because you ended up talking about um, military and international and all that kind of stuff at the end. And um, I've often, I have been asked a number of times why, why I come to events like this, which are for. Um, nothing to do with the military, basically, nothing to do with uh, governments, nothing to do with um, politics or anything like that. And so why is uh, MOD, Ministry of Defence, stroke NATO representative, am I even here? And uh, I find that quite interesting because what people tend to forget is that when you talk about all these institutions, we are composite of people and just people and therefore we have exactly the same issues as any other person or organisation or institution. It's just that some of our stakes are a little higher because we tend to have national secrets, we tend to have national capabilities, we tend to have 
international secret, international. And so some of the stuff that we're dealing with has got different stakes and different consequences if things don't quite work out the way we would like them to. And as with everybody else, uh, we have levels of security and we have levels of cybersecurity. Um, so why am I particularly interested in it? Because we are the weakest link, and I do agree with that. Somebody was asking me last week um, to explain, so I apologise for all of you that were there last week, because I know a number of you will have already heard me, um, talking about doors and windows. And Ralph, you touched on responsibility. And this is the one thing that I find really interesting, because for me there are parallels between the physical world and the virtual world. After I spoke last week, somebody came up to me and I was talking about having um, software and having applications and having things which automatically lock you and automatically shut you out, just as cars nowadays have a little magic tab that once you get you know, three metres away will automatically lock themselves. And why can't we do that kind of thing? After we've got AI coming along, we've got all sorts of smart technology coming along and all these kind of things. And somebody came up to me afterwards and said, do you know what, it really irritates me when my banking app locks me out after no activity in 30 seconds. And I'm like, okay. So, would you take your entire life savings, the entire contents of your bank account, all your credit, and put it as cash on your kitchen counter, and then go out for the day, leaving all your doors and windows open? Probably not. So why do you think the same should be true in the virtual world? So the thing that I find really interesting about the whole of this evolution, and I do believe that we're at the beginning of this process, is that it is going to be an evolutionary process over the next decade, probably over the next generation or two generations. So a few years ago, apparently, um, cars, for example, did not have locks on. And then came locks, which you had to unlock manually on the driver's side and the uh, passenger side. And it was always my nan uh, who used to say you could tell a gentleman if he unlocked the passenger door first and opened it for you to get in as the lady, uh, rather than unlocking his own driver's door first. Um, that was obviously back in the good old days. Now we just have central locking with a little tab that automatically unlocks your car no matter where you are if, you, if you're within three metres. But that's how much things have changed. Um, and I wonder whether or not cybersecurity will go the same way. However, what you can't legislate or um, do anything about is human stupidity. So you can have all these things on your car. You can have automatic central locking. You can have alarms and you can have immobilizers. And then I love it. Here in Estonia, it's minus 17 in the middle of winter. You filled your car up with petrol and you leave the keys in the ignition with the engine running while you go and pay for petrol. Seriously, and then you wonder what you're going to do when your car gets nicked. I mean, there is no insurance and there is no cover for that kind of stupidity or lack of awareness or lack of responsibility, whatever phrase you want to use. So I used last week the example of a house um, uh, using that as a mobile phone. So on your mobile phone, you have all your data, you have all your information and you have all your identity and you have access to all your funds and all your insurances and everything. Everything, everything here in Estonia is done, is done electronically. So I have everything electronic here, everything from my rental agreement to my bank accounts to my utility agreements to my insurances to everything. And I kind of assume that that's kind of safe because after it has to have my thumbprint, my thumbprint to open it. So that should be safe, right? because that's what I do and then it magically unlocks. But I love these people that have got these phones where you just draw a little pattern. Now, am I the only one that sits in a, in a, in a cafe and watches people do this thing? Oh yeah, I can copy that. So the, the situation that we're in with cybersecurity at the moment is that we have all this stuff in our house uh, and we don't log ourselves out of our apps. So generally in the room here, how many of you log out of Facebook every time you've used it? How many of you log out of LinkedIn every time you use it? So you're leaving your doors and windows open. How many of you get logged out of your banking app when you've used it? And that's the pain in the office because you have to log in every single time you go to do something online with your bank. Yeah, that's a pain, isn't it? Whereas Facebook and LinkedIn and all those other apps, you just click on the app and there you're straight in with all your data, all your contacts, all your meetings, all your social networking, everything's all there open. So all it takes is for somebody to get your phone, having watched you in the cafe, doing this on your screen, and they're in. You've got, they've got your entire life. They've got all your photos, they've got all your music, they've got all your contacts, you've got all your addresses and everything. All because we assume that this little electric fence around our house is going to stop somebody getting in, and it's not going to. 
So the biggest, so one of the biggest things for me is, and I don't, I don't have the answers, I don't have the answers, is that at some point we must have gone through this transition with cars and with houses and with insurance in the physical world with regards to getting insurance, but they're not going to pay out if you leave your car with the keys in the ignition, with the engine running, on the garage forecourt while you go and pay for petrol. They're not going to pay out, right? So whilst part of it is, as Ralph was saying, yes, we need to make cybersecurity really exciting, but actually, there's also that bit of me that questions why we think it's somebody else's problem to do it. So I live in a block of an apartment. There are 76 apartments in my block. So we've got maybe, you know, and we've got probably about the same number of PCs in my office. Now in my office, we have our one security officer. In my apartment block, I have no security officer. On my apartment, I have a door that locks. I have windows that lock. I have an alarm for intruder detection. Whose responsibility is it to put all those on when I leave my apartment? Mine. I don't have a security officer in my block of apartments that is going to come up to my flat when I decide to leave my flat, usher me out of my flat, go around and check all my doors and windows, set the alarm for me, and then follow me out, closing the door and locking it behind me. It sounds ludicrous in the physical world, right? So why do we expect it in the virtual world? Why do we expect our security officer to do that job for us? Why do we expect somebody else to set up technology, to set up software, to set up all these things, to do something which is, quite frankly, my responsibility. Now, there are a number of things that are changing that I believe will be drivers towards this. The first one is going to be the new EU legislation about cyber security, and that there is a, an accreditation framework that will need to be met by. But that is still, that is the same as putting locks on your car or locks on your front door. It is still up to you and I to actually use them. And there is very little that can be done about that. If you decide not to lock your front door, you can probably expect to come home and find half your belongings missing. So why do we think it's different in the virtual world? Is it because we can't see it? Is it, is it because, as Ralph was saying, we don't feel it? Until it actually happens and then, oh boy, you suddenly realise how painful it is when your entire bank account has been emptied. I don't know. However, some of, some of this has been tackled. So we have talked about training, we have talked about awareness, we have talked about education. And here's a couple of interesting statistics for you that I can't remember, so just let me get my little prompt card, because I don't want to misquote. In 2014, it was estimated that 95% of security breaches and data loss were caused by People. us clicking on things we shouldn't be clicking on, us responding to things we shouldn't be. Anybody got a clue what that is by 2017? No. No. Hmm? No. No. Only 64%. So we are learning. We are learning. So when we talk about in Estonia, I think is great for this. So Estonia is starting to introduce cybersecurity and all sorts of topics like this into their schools for their children from five years and upwards. Now, I remember when I was a kid being taught how to cross the road. Ralph, again, you were talking about how we, we learn to behave sensibly. We know not to walk down a dark alley at night using our mobile phone because we're likely to get mugged. We generally don't talk to strangers, but online we do. So there's this whole generational thing, unfortunately it affects us, where we've not been taught any of that because technology is still seen as new and technology is still seen as safe. But for the next generations coming up, it is absolutely critical. And you know what the other thing is, is that we are responsible for giving them a really bad start. Because how many of you have got children? And how many of you then post pictures of your children on Facebook? How many of you post, this is my children's party at this venue, and here are all their friends. This is my children in their brand new school uniform, thus giving away their, their location, and thus giving away which school they're going to. And then you can go to that school website, and you can find out everything from what the timetable looks like to what time they're going to leave school. And then you go and post pictures about what after-school clubs they're involved in. And so your child, when they reach the age of 12, and you say, no, you can't have a mobile phone, and no, you can't have a Facebook account, well, it's pointless saying that, because you've just spent the first 12 years of their life posting every piece of information about them. So for the next generation, it is going to be even more of an issue because they will have a digital footprint from the day they are born. For most of us, 
we've only got an issue for the last five, 10 years, really, maybe 15 if you've really been in this field for a long time. But for the next generation, it's a real issue. And I don't, I, I honestly, I don't know what the answer is. I think the other thing that will drive it, as well as some of the legislative stuff, is the education from a young age, but also the growing trend to analyse risks. So there is a growing market for cyber risk analysis. There is a growing risk looking at if you are accredited GDPR, cybersecurity, et cetera, et cetera. If you tick all the boxes with that, then your risk may be less. But that's like saying, yes, I have... Uh, my car has, you know, an immobiliser and an alarm and central locking and, you know, all the rest of it, and then you go and leave it unlocked. There's only so much that ticking boxes will do. There's only so much that we can cover off by having assessments. There's only so much we can cover off by having governance. There's only so much we can cover off by um, legislation. What it actually comes down to, and I don't know of any way around this other than saying it is your responsibility and it is my responsibility. We need to behave online in the same way that we would in the physical world. Now, I find it quite interesting. There were a couple of other things that I wrote down here. Why I think that there are parallels between the physical world and we are... Um, so I've, I've written down two words. The fact that online mirrors us here in the physical world. And those two words I've got written down are opportunist and scam. So most of the incidents that happen are opportunists. You think of a car theft. They're not going to go after the car that's locked. They're going to go after the car that's unlocked. So they're not going to go after a mobile phone that's got a thumbprint recognition on it. They're going to go for one where you just sort of do this little, this little Z pattern on the screen and you're in. They're not going to go for one where they see people log out of every app that they've been in. They're going to go for one where they see somebody leaving themselves in. They're not going to go for the machine where you do control, alt, delete, enter before you walk away. They're going to go for the one that's left unlocked on the desk because that's the easy way in. So it's just, that's exactly the same as in the physical world. They're not going to go after the one that's locked. They'll go after the one that's unlocked. And all these things are so simple, but for some reason we just don't apply it when it comes to the virtual world. And then the scam one is probably one of the biggest. It's probably one of the biggest. I've had two incidents recently um, just to prove that even though I work in government and even though I work for the military and even though I'm behind all these secure fences and even though bloody, 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 I am still susceptible to them. So I've, I've had two. One told me that I had a parking um, ticket and that I was due to pay a fine. So it was asking me for money. It looked quite official, actually. Um, I was just a little bit suspicious because, funny enough, I wasn't in that part of town on that day. In actual fact, I wasn't even in Estonia on that particular day. So that was a bit of a giveaway. But my first reaction was, oh, I've got a parking ticket. And it was only when I when and where, because I'm going to complain about this, that then I actually looked at the details. If I'd have just reacted to it and clicked on the link that gave me the, de the, the picture, I would have downloaded a whole load of malware. The second one was actually Tuesday. I went into my inbox and there was an invoice from a company in Lillestrom in Norway. Now I was, I have been to Lillestrom. Have you heard this one? Is it going the rounds? And I thought to myself, well, I was in Lillestrom. I was in Lillestrom 14 months ago. It's a bit late for them to be sending me an invoice. So I flagged down the IT guy, my one security officer for my entire apartment block. I flagged him down and I said, I've got this suspicious bit of post. And he looked at it and he said, yeah, you're right, that's a suspicious bit of post. And, and yeah, when he looked at it, there it was. But again, my first instinct was still to click on it because I didn't think it was right. I wanted to open it to double check the information. But I didn't. Well, it went, no, because I've worked with... Uh, Absolutely, it does. So long, but I deleted my first bill from my uh, new um, uh, building association because um, it was empty. It came from a Gmail and an Excel attachment. I was like, really? Yes, delete. Yep. And the second month, they got it again. I was like, maybe. Maybe it's not a chance. Absolutely. So I always check, but it was... But the natural instinct is always to open the post. And I think about it in the, ver in the physical world. That's what I would do. If I see an envelope I don't recognise, if I see something that I don't recognise, I will open it to see what's in it to validate, to validate it. 
So some of it is about unlearning some of our behaviours as well. So it's not just teaching people new behaviours, it's also about unlearning some of the things that we have been doing for decades. Now I wish I could say there's a really, really easy fix for this. There's some new technology coming along, there's some part of AI that's coming along, there's brand new you know, online technology. Sadly, one of the issues that there is with AI is AI is programmed by us. Yeah, and right. we are flawed. And most of us are also prejudiced. So when we program, we program with our prejudice. We program with our assumed learning. The one thing, and I love Ralph's example of sending a, uh, um, a female um, actress in as a, as a television, because the one thing that AI will never do is it will never do the lateral thinking. You cannot program lateral thinking. You cannot program that crazy idea that comes from left of stage. So AI will never spot that phishing attack, or that personal attack, or that social engineering attack that comes from left of, or right of, or through something else. Because all we can do is we can program it to, to react to certain patterns, and they're already known, so what's the point? So we are only at the very beginning of this, and unfortunately, um, I do think it is going to get worse as the Internet of Things comes online, because everything that we do is going to be connected, and everything that we do is going to require some kind of us looking after it. At some point, it will have to stop with us expecting somebody else to do it, and we are actually going to have to take responsibility and start doing it ourselves. And I'm going to leave it on that challenging end of note, because... Um, I don't actually have any solutions. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't imagine teaching everybody in the entire world, even 1.3 million people in Estonia, to be hackers just so that they get the oh wow factor. I, I don't, but I don't know what the answer is. You're right, we can get some proportion of society. But even in Estonia, where it's a relatively small population, every single member of that 1.3 million has this issue. And I don't know how we tackle it. You know, I think one part, and I think it's much more difficult uh, challenge to make it exciting, but the problem at the moment is people don't see value in it. Mm. Yeah, but oh, yeah, there's 2.5 contingent bytes made every day, you know, created every day. Yes, 90% of the data in the world the moment is created in the last three years. Yeah, and then they tell us, yeah, your data assets are so valuable. Why? They only value at the moment because of the potential risk, the shit you don't like. Because, oh yeah, now it hurt me, I can feel it. Now I feel that it's valuable, but it's actually not seen that the ability of you to be able to, on Facebook all the time, has its value as well. Mm -hmm. You know? Somehow, yes, my car is valuable. My Facebook account, however, is completely disposable, even though it has all my life in it. But I bet it's not disposable because if you turn the telephone masks off for two hours, you would have hysterical, you would have people dialing emergency numbers saying, I can't use, well, they wouldn't be able to dial, would they? It would be yeah. peaceful. Maybe we should do that. That would end our, that would end our issue. Yeah, they don't see, kind of, they don't perceive the it's not, value. It's not personal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Q&A. Q&A. Yes. So I have a question that we all, both of you guys talked about um, awareness and you talked about taking responsibility. How much would you split this between having the lock and knowing how to lock it? Right? So having the awareness Absolutely. Absolutely. And having the, like, if I was to say name like five, five people in this room who have something that's protecting their phone yes. from malware right now or from any kind of vulnerability. Absolutely. I, I wouldn't, except for him, I think maybe for other people, nobody would have it. Yes. So what is the split between awareness and so that's so that that I come back to. So it's almost like, and, and, and I mentioned this last week I when I was talking. The question because online people don't hear it here. Hear the question. What, what okay. Is the split between awareness and tools. So what is the difference between having cyber security awareness and actually having the tools to be able to be cyber secure? And the split of it. How much? And the split. Like okay. How, if I do, do you want to focus on, on on getting people aware about it, or do you want to focus on and say, hey? These are the 10 tools that you must have as basic, and then you don't have to worry about Okay, about so if we had a number of tools for people to choose from, then that would be great. 
So there are a number of apps, for example, that do not even have the ability to log out. There are apps that do not have the ability for me to delete my account. There are a number of apps out there where I cannot remove my own information. It's already gone, it's already on the cloud, it's already filed, it's already owned by somebody else and all the rest of it. So there are a number of, there are a number of things out there that we do that we cannot do anything about. In terms of securing my phone, for example, in the same way that I talked about securing my house, it would be great, yes, most houses now are built with doors that lock. Most phones are now built with something that locks. The difficulty is, is that it's a bit like um, many years ago, houses were built with Yale locks, really simple. Thing. And, and we know now that you can open a Yale lock just by slipping a credit card down and it causes the, the bolt to go back and then that's it, you're in. Whereas five years ago, that level of security was fine. Now, in the UK, if you want your house to be insured, you have to have a five bar security lock as standard. So those standards are also changing. but. They're incredibly expensive, and, you, and, and as an individual, I can't go down to the local hardware store, Bauhoff, and buy one of those. I have to have a professional come in and do it. So there is also this issue of, whilst we're developing our, our security tools, they need to be affordable, they need to be accessible, and they need to be Muppet-proof. So, Muppet is stupid, by the way, in British English. Yes, so <laughs> Muppets, yes, they, they need to be idiot-proof. Um, but there is still the issue of people thinking that because they've got it on their phone, they are now protected. I have an electric fence, my house is now safe. Apart from the person who's gonna get out of their car with their rubber car mat, put it over the electric fence and step over it. So it's, what would I say the percentage is? I reckon it's 60-40, 60% users, 40% software, because if everybody used what we've already got in place, that percentage that I talked about would be a lot lower than it is. It should be down at about 20 to 30%, but we're still up at because people don't use the technology that we do have. We have password generators, we have password storers, we have some of this, we have dual factor. How many of you use dual factor authentication for your Facebook? What is that? Okay, so, so, even, so even some of what's actually available for us, we are still not using because we don't think we need to, we don't think it's appropriate to us, we just, whatever. There are no consequences until the consequence hits and then it's all too late. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Go on. I have a question. I did a, I just, a, I'm a DBO for data protection officer for a local government as well. And I did uh, hours and hours of training about cyber hygiene and cyber security measures you personally can take. Passwords. Do not share anything ever, any passwords by email. And then a month later, it was just last week, I did a test. I sent them an email going, I'm a data protection officer, please send me your uh, username and password. And they replied. Uh, out of seven people, 20 people answered, and I got three people who sent me the actual logins and, and passwords. One of them realized, oh, that was fishy, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> Do you have to tell, please now, could you change your passwords? Yeah, absolutely. So it still happens, and, and we'll never be, we will never be 100%. So that risk will never be zero, because you are playing with humans. Um, can I take one more, because I've seen one question at the back, one quick one at the back. Okay, sure. Uh, just a quick answer to yours as well. So perhaps you should apply natural selection. So fire all of those people who are replying, yes. and, uh, and then, the natural elimination process will take place. No, I think, you know, patience is a virtue. Okay, uh, but uh, a direct question would be that uh, I totally, totally agree that education doesn't hurt and raising the uh, hygiene level of users definitely helps. But uh, in reality, uh, you will be faced with a situation, uh, the divide between the natural world, the physical world and the cyber world is that in the cyber world you can uh, have automated attacks which at the same time direct some really specific vulnerabilities. So you might have your door locked, but there might be like, you could pick the lock quite easily. So uh, is there anything we can do on the legislation level or, uh, 
on, on the governmental or the European level, which should be applied or, or what should be worked on to uh, raise the uh, cybersecurity level and to protect the users. Okay, so what can be done governmentally or nationally or legislatively to improve security levels? So within NATO, um, there is the Cyber Defence Pledge, which addresses exactly that and is expecting nations to spend a certain amount of their, um, their, GD, um, their gross national product on uh, improving cyber security, especially of infrastructure and large businesses, etc. And there is also now the new EU legislation which is coming in, which is also looking at it. However, I would say that I do not believe that there is any way ever going to be a 100% um, protected system. So there is also the other huge bit about security is resilience. So how does your business cope when you are attacked? What is your response mechanism? How do people cope when they can't have their mobile phone for two hours? How does your business continue when you cannot use it because you are removing malware for five hours? Um, and that is also something else that I do not think is recognised. So as an individual, you know, I, I have that responsibility as well. If I was told by the government that there had been an attack on infrastructure and that mobile phones were only allowed for two hours in a 24-hour period, how would I manage my two hours? What's actually important to me for those two hours? So am I, as, a, as an adult, as a responsible person, am I also, because if they told me I was going to be without electricity for two hours, I would have my candles, I would have my camp stove, I would have my bottled water, I would have my tea bag, you know, being English, I can't do without my tea for two hours, so I would have my camping stove and all tea making equipment ready and lined up. And I would be ready for the lights to go out and the heating to go off. If somebody told me that I can't have my mobile phone, yeah, quite a little raise of the, for those of you that can't see that there was a little raise of the eyebrow. Absolutely. So again, as individuals and as society, we still have a long, long way to go. Done. Done. Thank you very much, everybody. Can I take this thing off now? I can speak freely. You can. Is it time for cake? No, it's the time for swear. No, it's time for cake. No, I know. No, we still have one more. Thank you to both of our speakers, it was wonderful. I think one of the reoccurring themes that we're seeing in all of these discussions is that cybersecurity as it stands at the moment is an exceptionally gentrified concept. It's something which is shrouded in mystery. People think of cybersecurity and they think of firewalls and enterprise level things and encryption which apparently comes in bits I have no idea which bit is the good bit but you get encryption in different bits and there's a number which is good and this is disabling people from having uptake of cyber security into their everyday lives and many people despair at the situation they say well no the hackers just keep on getting better malware keeps on getting better every single day but I think we have to look back at our own evolution and understand that what differentiates humans from machines is the fact that we are organic. We do adapt, we do overcome. Think back to when electricity was first introduced into the home. We understood so little about electricity that it used to come into your home in a completely uninsulated long wire. Just a huge live wire with no circuit break and with no switch to turn it off. So people used to have a long piece of wire in their living room and they would just hook their lamp onto the open current. And if you were walking past it and you accidentally grabbed it, you would die. But eventually we learnt, namely because a lot of people got electrocuted. But eventually we learnt, we became safer and we introduced processes and we developed an organic body of knowledge which we transmit generation to generation in the home which teaches us how to use electricity safely. And now electricity is an integral part of our lives and I think in the future the same thing will happen with cyber security. We will, we will evolve to have an organic body of knowledge that we transmit in the home. We will understand that these devices, which require cyber security, are simply something that we teach our children to use from a young age. And that's when we'll develop a sort of herd immunity to the overwhelming majority of cyber attacks. As I said earlier, we are lucky enough to be hosted by Startup Wise Guys, and now we're going to hear from one of the teams in this batch of the Startup Wise Guys Incubator. And they've got a very novel concept. 
we all know that most people don't learn through a raw textbook approach. Most people like to learn through narrative and often people who are more artsy and creative, they learn through narrative more than they do from a hard mathematics textbook. It's the left right hand side of the brain divide. So what these guys have done is they've taken the concept of an evolving narrative algorithm just as you would get in one of your leading computer games. Every time you interact with a character you have a few options that you can pick from in the conversation and that option, that dialogue then evolves evolves the game and the user experience to customize it for you. And they've got a wonderful little program running which teaches cyber security to frontline personnel. So it teaches it in a narrative based happy little story tell which works perfectly for secretaries, for users who have access to passwords but don't necessarily need specialised security training. They don't need to know about the coding and all of that. They just have to understand if somebody walks into my company crying and says, oh I've forgotten to print out my mother's birthday card, can you just please take this USB and print it out for me while they're holding chocolates and flowers and they're dressed in their Sunday best. You don't say yes because you have no idea what's on that USB. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Daniel, who's going to introduce their new concept from Syx. There we are. Thank you. Yeah, it yeah. goes there. Is it okay? Perfect. Okay. Just clip that somewhere. Or if you like me, you can hold it. Okay, thanks. Um, so, hi, my name is Daniel. Uh, I'm from Syx, uh, the co-founder of a company that is dealing uh, with uh, the aware awareness of non-technical employees across different organizations. Uh, basically, we want uh, the non-technical people to become an asset of cybersecurity, and it is really hard to me to speak after or following uh, this uh, to uh, really impressive uh, speeches, but uh, let me share a few thoughts uh, from our side. Um, we used to say that cybersecurity is just as simple as a shoelace, because when you step out from your secure environment, from your home into the wide, you go out to the street, what you do, you fix your shoelaces, otherwise you will fell down, you will be injured, it will hurt you. But most of the people just don't realize that before they touch any connected devices like mobile phones, uh, um, computers, tablets, smart watches, uh, they are touching something where they have to use the same uh, methodologies and they have to fix their cyber shoelaces. Most of them uh, don't know that they have uh, cyber shoelaces as well. So we think that uh, human uh, is the worst designed part of a cyber security system but we can help uh, to make them better. Already, we already heard that 95% or more than 90% of cyber security breaches are tied to human error but uh, this can be lower by education. But the question is, uh, how do we educate people? Because the old lecture-based education types and training uh, methodologies are not effective in a dynamic world and in a dynamic domain, what cyber means today. Um, during our uh, pitches, we have a short story about a bank robbery in Bangladesh that happened three years ago in 2016. We used to say that one single employee for, was able to save $900 million from being stolen. And the reason behind it that he was able to save this $900 million for the bank is that he detected a typo in, a, in uh, several transfer uh, notices. Um, and because uh, typos are a usual um, identificational um, part 
uh, for detecting um, cyber fraud, um, it was his about his preparedness and awareness. Um, and that's the point where human can be or human can become uh, the biggest asset. Um, as I mentioned, cyber is changing really dynamically and uh, humans are able to keep up the pace with this dynamically changing environment uh, only if we teach them because current solutions are not able to give the right knowledge uh, with the right frequency um, because continuity is again a very important uh, thing when we are talking about cyber security and cyber security preparedness. Um, again, I want, again another thing that we used to say uh, that cyber security and cyber security skill sets will become more important within a few years than the office uh, software skill set. So it will be more important to uh, know more about cyber security and how to be cyber secure than to handle uh, an office document or a spreadsheet in Excel. Um, just imagine that you are the secretary of a CEO. Uh, you are handling probably the most important uh, information of a company, but usually these type of employees are not educated well Maybe they are really good in making spreadsheets and making documents, uh, writing letters, uh, sending out a lot of email instead of their uh, leaders. But they are not really well prepared uh, from a cybersecurity perspective. And most of the solutions that are good for the, or that are used to um, get cybersecurity education mainly use the old-fashioned lecture-based trainings or they are made for uh, the high qualified technical guys, the black belted cyber ninjas. Um, I just arrived back from Oslo yesterday. Uh, we visited a Paranoia conference there. It was a two-day conference and uh, we identified several potential competitors for our company and uh, it was really interesting to see uh, that most of them are still uh, fighting with the content of their educational um, system because maybe they are really good in identifying the weakest links i mean the uh, the very badly prepared uh, employees but the content that can that they can give to them to raise their awareness is still something lecture-based, uh, old-fashioned thing, or other solutions are really powerful in the meaning of gamification. But uh, I told uh, the guy there that, okay, but show me a secretary of a CEO who wants to learn uh, Linux basics, who wants to learn blue teaming, and who wants to learn these kind of things. They are not interested in these things. What you have for those guys who are non-technical uh, people and who doesn't have a technical mindset. And uh, he told me that they have nothing uh, to these guys uh, currently. So we think that active learning and uh, learning by doing techniques are really important uh, in cybersecurity education. Uh, these are uh, pedagogic, pedagogical techniques uh, designed to improve the students and the participants' um, absorption of uh, lesson content and theories and different concepts. Um, this is an approach that uh, shifts learning away from um, possible or passive um, instructor focusing teaching uh, and the prioritizing of active learning is the way uh, that we think will be uh, really useful. Uh, one way to um, implement active learning and learning by doing techniques is doing exercises. Most of the people 
really don't know what we are talking about when we say cybersecurity exercise, but it's again really simple or really similar to uh, real life or physical life exercises. When we say exercise, most of the people are thinking about uh, go to the fitness room and uh, having bigger muscles. And uh, I would say yes, uh, cybersecurity exercises are really similar to these kind of uh, fitness activities because if you want to be more fit in the physical world then you go out, you go uh, for a run, you go to the fitness room, you make exercises, you train yourself uh, and you do it in a repetitive way. You make the si really similar things, tasks, uh, multiple times and do it again and again from day to day uh, if you want to become Arnold Schwarzenegger or just become more fit, you go to the fitness room and do the similar tasks, similar exercises, uh, always. And it's really the same in cybersecurity. If you want to be more cyber secure, if you want to have a cybersecurity mindset implemented, uh, then the best way is to do cybersecurity related tasks exercises on a daily basis. So that's why I say continuity and repetitiveness is really important um, in this way. But back to the secretary of the CEO that I mentioned, her daily task is not to be cyber secure. Uh, on a daily basis, he, she is not uh, using um, cyber security tools. He is not uh, using any thing that is related to cybersecurity, okay, I mean, if uh, she just want to change the letter, the um, type um, of the letters in a Word document, it's okay. But from that point, when she is trying to download a new uh, letter type um, from the internet, then it is uh, coming to a point when, where cybersecurity is getting uh, more and more important. Um, brain is uh, working just our body, so this repetitiveness is really important. And uh, what we do is giving simple, really simple tasks, but on, in a continuous way. And, uh, this continuity, this repetitiveness that is lead to routine, which is again very important in cybersecurity because on a daily basis, we don't have this routine today. We don't have the routine like uh, going out. Someone already mentioned that crossing the road, when you cross the road, you uh, look around uh, if there is any dangerous um, vehicle around you, but you don't do this when you use the cyber domain and you enter uh, to the cyber domain. So routine that leads uh, to awareness in the cyber domain. Um, back to the exercises. Um, usually these are simulations, scenario-based simulations. So there's a story uh, that can be really targeted, that can be really personalized. Otherwise, uh, the user won't be interested enough, so he or she won't be learning enough from uh, that specific situation. Um, from an organizational perspective, um, there is no fundamental difference between the simulated events and the realistic events. So that's why we think that uh, simulations uh, are the best way to gain more cyber knowledge for the non-technical uh, workforce. And as I mentioned, uh, targeting and personalization is really critical because all of us in this uh, room has really different cyber security profile. As I mentioned, uh, the security of the CEO, for example, here in Estonia at the bank, has really different cybersecurity profile and threat profile than, let's say, an HR accountant in the Middle East at an oil company. Different threats, different uh, countermeasures are uh, needed. 
techniques of active learning are really good because uh, they are focusing on the participants' activities, uh, they maximize uh, participation, uh, they are really motivational and gives immediacy um, to the subject matter. These are all great benefits, as I mentioned, in a domain that is growing and changing so fast, like cyber. Um, and what is more important, um, or again, uh, an important part, is gamification that is, again, already mentioned today. Um, we think that uh, if we don't want to feel our employees that they already have just again uh, another task or a compliance li related uh, issue, uh, the gamification would be a good solution as if they feel it's kind of fun, then they will be more engaged uh, and more motivated. Um, at the end, we combine um, active learning and, and gamification with some psychological principles, um, which is like competition and uh, personal success. We think that uh, this can also help uh, people to be more cyber secure. And uh, before I finish, um, I would like to announce that from today, um, our demo is available online. So if you visit demo.cyx.io, demo.cyx.io, then you can reach our really first uh, rapid prototype. We already have uh, two different scenarios in it. One is related to the telecommunications sector, one is to the banking sector. Uh, you can use it from whichever uh, device you want because uh, uh, it is able to handle um, mobile devices as well. It's just a teaser from us how we are thinking about uh, the future of cybersecurity trainings. And uh, by the end of uh, this month, four, five, six more scenarios will be uploaded. So. If you are interested, uh, please uh, stay tuned because we will uh, upload more uh, specific targeted uh, scenarios. And I think that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you to all of our speakers. For those of you who did get the link, do go and click on it. I actually got to have a little bit of a pre-test on it a few days ago, and it, um, it's quite fun and it's quite provocative because it gives you a couple of different options, and you look at it and you just think, oh, okay, well, I'll click that one. But then before you click it, you think, oh, but hang on. This has got to do with cybersecurity. Am I supposed to be doing this? Should I be doing something else? And I really sat there for about five minutes. I looked at it. Do I want to pull the network cable out before I call the system administrator? Or do I just turn my computer off? It's really engaging. It's good. It's fun. Particularly if you were a little bit of a video games geek like me when you were younger. It's very character progression-y. And it's a great way for people who aren't good at the hardcore maths side of cybersecurity, for example me, but people who do enjoy the thought and the mental side of it to get involved and have a little bit of a play. I just would like to take this opportunity to once again thank Startup Wise Guys for hosting this event. Thank you to all of the people online who have tuned in globally. It's been great to have you here, so to speak. And for the people who are here physically in Tallinn, Estonia, we have a cool little setup of one of their games which has been connected to an Xbox 360 camera. So you don't even have to press keys, you just tap a coloured piece of card on the floor and then you can work through different scenarios and exercises there and it's a good way to introduce how the concept can be practically applied to an organisation. It would actually work quite well in 
a communal recreation area, a coffee spot in an office, and it's great fun. So please do stay around, and thank you for coming, and thank you to both of our speakers.